little bit about ASD. Um, we are Appalachian Sustainable Development. Uh, we're a nonprofit based in Bristol, Virginia, and our mission is to help transition Appalachia to a more resilient economy and a healthier population by supporting local agriculture, exploring new economic opportunities, and connecting people to healthy food. Uh, we partnered with Herbalasha, the School of Herbal Medicine based in Tennessee to bring you this Seed to Medicine ser webinar series. Uh, we switched over to a webinar, even though this series was originally planned as an in-person workshop to serve the local community here um, in the surrounding area of Bristol and Central Appalachia. But due to, uh, as you know, the ongoing COVID-19 health crisis, we transitioned to a virtual setting in hopes of reaching even more people. And we do feel that this information on herbal medicine and sharing the access to this information about medicinal plants and how to use them to promote health and wellness is important to everybody, um, especially now. So one of the other components of our work here at ASD in the agroforestry department is the Appalachian Harvest Herb Hub. And this herb hub reflects our commitment to the community and all the special plants that we're caring for here in Appalachia. Um, this is a shared use facility and it enables local farmers to bring their sustainably cultivated herbs to market through their sustainable growing practices um, and harvest training that we provide. We also provide cost share opportunities and shared use processing equipment and then we can aggregate um, or collect their supply and market that supply to larger buyers. And so you participating in our webinar today um, makes us makes it more able for us to get in touch with more farmers and offer further assistance to everyone um, that we work with. So thank you for joining us today. You, I'd like to introduce Robin Suggs, the procurement manager at ASD, and we're going to be discussing harvest and post-harvest handling today. So go ahead, Robin. Well, thanks for that introduction, Sierra. Um, I appreciate that. As Sarah mentioned, I'm Robin Suggs. I'm the procurement manager at um, Appalachian Sustainable Development's Herb Hub. And today we're going to talk about harvest and post-harvest handling. I get my uh, camera here in, in sync. Um, so what is harvest and post-harvest handling? Well, Harvest is pretty self-explanatory, and so is post-harvest handling. Harvest is the act of um, actually reaping the, the rewards and the bounty of your crop after you have put in the hard work of growing it. And post-harvest handling is everything that you do thereafter before it gets into the hands of your customer. So the harvest is really... Um, where the rubber begins to meet the road in terms of your profitability and in terms of you getting your product to market. You can do a great job of growing something and follow all the protocols and all the rules and have great weather and great climate and fertilize correctly and weed and make sure you're doing great IPM and pest management. Um, but if you skimp on your research and your due diligence in terms of your harvest and, har and post-harvest handling, You've done all that for naught um, because it doesn't take much to ruin a crop if it's handled poorly after it's harvested. Okay, so really what we're talking about here is um, the ability to carry through with efficient processing after you have done everything it takes to grow your crop to get it ready to harvest time. And so the parameters that we're looking at here are things like the timing of the harvest, how much you're gonna be harvesting, the plant part, and how that relates to the prior to, and the tools that you're gonna need for harvest. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is timing. Um, of course, we have a calendar up here, and uh, knowing when to harvest your crop is probably one of the most important considerations uh, when you're determining um, your activities around that harvest. Um, typically, the spring and summer months are when we're harvesting aerial portions of the, or the above ground portions of the plant. And that generally includes herbs, stems, bark, those types of things. It's when all the energy and most of the bioactives 
uh, or up in the, the part of the plant that's actively growing. So many times, not only is um, the, the warmer parts of the year, the time when the above ground portion of the plant are apparent and available to harvest, but also is when a lot of the medicinal constituents and the aromatic constituents are at their peak. And this can vary a little bit from herb to herb. Some, some herbs are um, higher in bioactives around the time that they're blooming or seeding. Others, when they're actively growing. So knowing a little bit about what you're growing for in terms of your market and your customer can come into play here. Uh, in the cooler times of the year, the fall and the winter months, we're generally talking about below ground portions of the plant when it comes to harvest. Things like roots, rhizomes, bulbs, that sort of thing. The tops are usually are going down or have already died down. And so all of the energy and the bioactives have, have um, retreated back below the soil line. So typically when we're looking at herbs like, you know, black cohosh and golden seal, um, those types of things, we're looking at a uh, harvest during the dormant parts of the year, which would be the fall and the winter. Another consideration is the size and scale of your harvest, and that will directly impact the level of planning and the equipment tools that you need to carry out that harvest. If you just have a few plants or, or a small scale cottage gardener or a backyard herbalist, or um, you know someone like myself who uh, has multiple um, relatively small to medium sized business, businesses that they have supplied, uh, usually hand tools and that sort of thing are appropriate for harvest. Uh, if you're a larger market gardener or larger market herb supplier, um, you may be looking at acquisition of equipment, power equipment in some instances, as evidenced by those tractors harvesting the um, lavender on the photo to the left, as opposed to the hand tools being used to harvest the lavender on your right. So, um, research in, the, in the, the, the plant part that you need to harvest, um, you know, that really goes back to uh, what your customer is looking for, what market that you're trying to, um, to supply. Dandelion here is a great example of a plant that has both useful roots and leaves. The leaves are typically used um, as a culinary um, in culinary uses. And the roots are typically used for medicinal and bitter uses in the medicinal trade. Um, so knowing exactly the plant part and the time that you harvest a plant part is very, uh, very critical. And it's also very critical when you're trying to determine what type of tools you're going to need to harvest. And we'll look at that in just a minute. So, you know, I mentioned smaller harvest. Uh, cottage scale industry harvest and backyard um, production of herbs. Most of the time these um, above ground parts can be harvested with something as simple as pruners or hedge clippers or uh, in the photo over on the right there's a scythe. Um, you know these are typically fairly inexpensive to source. Uh, they're not complicated to use. Uh, when they break or when you lose them, they're not expensive to replace. So I would recommend that anyone in, in any kind of commercial production or personal use production for that matter, um, or if you're starting out small, as I would recommend if you're just getting up and running, you know, invest in some high quality hand tools. Like I say, these are not hard to find at local hardware stores and big box, uh, big, big box merchants or online. But, you know, try them out. It's probably better to go try them out in the store or something that, you know, feels good in your hand and something that you feel competent in using. But most of these small hand tools are adequate for um, small scale harvest. So I recommend you start out with these, get comfortable with them. And then as your, as your production, if or if your production scales up, you can move on to something else that we'll look at later. So, let's say you do decide to grow your business or let's say you already find yourself in a fairly uh, medium to large scale business in terms of what you're trying to harvest. Uh, what are the types of tools that you can use for harvesting aerial parts of plants? Uh, one thing we have pictured here is a battery powered hedge trimmer. And um, I put the battery powered hedge trimmer up here because 
not only are they environmentally friendly, they're fairly quiet to use, and they don't make a lot of um, don't make a lot of noxious fumes when you're out there working on a 90 degree day. Uh, but they're also the, the state of lithium batteries has come a long way. So usually you can get anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes out of a charge these days. Uh, you can carry an extra battery to the field with you. Uh, many times these um, battery powered hand tools are very adequate for uh, a little larger operation, something a little bigger than a, than a backyard. You can also buy gasoline powered hedge clippers um, and you know, in, in, even, um, you know, depending on what you're harvesting, you may even require a small saw, uh, power saw, if you've got woody material that you're harvesting. Uh, but this is a kind of equipment that you might need for, a, you know, relatively small acreage or medium sized production areas. If we look at the harvest of woody plant materials, you know, I just mentioned the power saw. The one that we, we, we see down here at the bottom is a little larger power saw. If you're, if you're harvesting things like witch hazel bark, cherry bark, uh, slippery elm bark, those types of things, you may need a power saw, something like this gasoline powered model that we're, we're looking at in the lower left hand corner. Um, if you're harvesting small quantities or smaller branches of uh, plants grown for barks, like the ones I mentioned. Something like this small hand saw may do the trick if you're just harvesting a few, but if you're harvesting quite a few, I'd recommend probably looking at something like this gasoline power, powered saw or a battery powered saw, which is something I have at, at my home. Over here on the right, we look at a man that's um, involved in harvesting witch hazel. Those, what he's got on that tarp that he's getting ready to lift up and package are the stems and leaves of the witch hazel. So he's probably used small cutting tools, small hand cutting tools to harvest those. And he's just bundling them up and getting ready to take them into process or to clean. So again, depending on the size of your job, um, you know, you may want to consider using, using some power tools along the lines of these, especially when you're harvesting woody plant material. Another thing that you're going to need when you're harvesting things like bark from um, tree trunks and branches are a good sharp knife. Uh, what we have on the left is a draw saw or a draw knife. Um, these are typically used um, when you're stripping bark off larger, larger pieces of wood or tree trunks. Um, many times it's good to have something to hold the piece of wood in place while you use your hands to draw this along the, uh, the bark. And what, you, what you're really trying to do is separate the bark from the wood without cutting into the wood and without leaving too much of the inner bark behind. The inner bark, when you're harvesting bark, is the part where the bioactive compounds occur. Things like slip realm, witch hazel, black cherry bark, the, the good stuff is in the inner bark. And if you have a, a plant like slip realm where you're harvesting bark, um, we do a process called rossing, and that's something that we can probably discuss in a little while as well. But you know, you don't need to use a draw knife. You can use um, anything from a pocket knife to a large kitchen knife, depending on the size and scale of your work. So again, there's gonna be some trial and error. error. You're gonna get out in the field and really and truly every, everybody's needs and, and um, preferences can be a little different. So the, what I would recommend is find a few tools, try them out and see what works for you best. So the other plant parts that we're generally harvesting are roots, rhizomes, and any other below ground um, plant tissue that, is, that you'll be using to later clean and process. Most small, um, most, I'd say most people involved in wild harvesting and small scale production will use hand tools, much like the ones pictured here. Again, um, you know, I would encourage you to use various types of hand tools. For me, I started out trying to use a shovel. Um, I found out pretty quickly that shovels are not, at least for me, were not the best tool to use to harvest roots and rhizomes and that sort of thing. Um, I've seen people use trowels. I've seen people use harvesting knives. Um, personally, I don't care for either of those. 
I like something like a little hand mattock or a small pickaxe because some roots that are stubborn or deep in the ground um, can benefit from the, uh, the, the prying action that these tools allow for. Uh, especially if you're in a forested area, if you're growing woodland botanicals and you have some competing tree roots that you're working against and rocks and that sort of thing, the prying action that you get with these hand mattocks and pickaxes uh, can be quite advantageous. Plus, if you have other roots coming in from other areas that are interfering with your harvest, most of these hand tools have a cutting edge. You can cut those offending roots off and, and get out what you need to. So I will recommend starting with something like that and seeing how it works for you. Um, if we're talking about larger quantities, especially with field grown material, things like marshmallow root, uh, or in this case, what we have pictured is a potato harvest. But, you know, um, we generally don't talk about potatoes when we're talking about medicinal herbs, but, you know, anything that grows under the ground that you're growing in an open setting in uh, an area, uh, sort of a conventional agriculture setting where you can get larger equipment in, you may need to go with something like a tractor mounted uh, implement like the one shown digging these potatoes if you've got a large scale production area and have a lot of roots to dig. Um, this is not a complicated implement. Basically it, it undercuts. Some people use subsoilers. Some people use plows and run along both sides of the roads and just simply turn the rows up. So um, you can get a little creative with this and figure out what works best. Uh, you know, what works good for digging echinacea roots may not work well for, for digging uh, things like marshmallow and that sort of thing. So a little bit of experimentation may be required or visiting with someone who has uh, the scale of, of production that you have in mind and, and maybe getting some pointers from them on exactly what works for them and maybe trialing those out in your own production. All right, it looks like we don't have any questions quite yet, um, but just please keep in mind, we'll take breaks throughout the video um, so that you can ask questions. So I'll give just a minute in case there's any so far, um, but we will have Q and A's after each section of the processing process that we go through. Not seeing anything pop up, so we're gonna move right on. Okay, Robin? That sounds good. Okay, so after we've completed our harvest, what comes next? Well, really, probably one of the most important processes that you'll be involved with is cleaning uh, your material after you harvest it. And the main thing you're gonna need besides the material itself is plenty of water. Um, most roots especially require plenty of water to dislodge dirt, rocks, insects, um, other competing plant roots that may be, may be harvested along with your target crop. So good potable water or water that's safe for drinking is very important in this process. Um, in addition to um, the availability of potable water is to make sure you have good water pressure, especially if you're using hose and nozzles to conduct the cleaning. What we show here are some black cohosh roots on a screen, a stainless steel screen. And what this allows you to do is to use a pressure uh, nozzle on your hose in to actually um, pressure wash, as it were, these roots. Uh, with a fine stream of water. And um, as that happens, this screen allows for dirt and rocks and debris and insects and other roots to, to filter down, uh, you know, as you clean the rhizome, filter down the ground and, and be washed away. Also in this particular case, we have a photo uh, that shows an extraneous root that was intertwined in some of these growing intertwined in some of these black cohosh. Now's the time when you have these on the screen and when you're washing them to make sure that you remove any non-target roots or any non-target species uh, or adulterate species uh, that may be occurring in your harvested roots at this time. 
So now's a really good time for visual inspection while you're washing. So when we're cleaning leaves, um, we have some different considerations. You know, leaves are things like, um, uh, are things like this wonderful lavender that Michelle over at Herbalatcha was kind enough to, uh, to supply to us. And let's see. Okay, I just saw a question come up um, from a participant regarding the wearing of protective equipment while washing. And this participant asked if we were um, concerned about maybe uh, skin and other parts of our body contacting plant material while we were processing it. And I think the, uh, the plant that was mentioned was bloodroot. There are plants like bloodroot and mayapple that you may require some gloves, some protective equipment, even safety glasses uh, if, you're, if you're cleaning roots and water is splashing uh, up in your face and, and, um, and all over you, you may require uh, safety glasses, you may require gloves. So those are certainly good considerations to keep in the back of your mind. Like I say, this is, this is some nice um, lavender that I think was processed by Michelle over at Herbalatcha. And um, when, you're when you're handling and, and cleaning the upper parts of plant material, like this lavender, and here's some fresh lavender in here as well. You see what this looked like before it was dried down. Um, the, the upper or the aerial portions of the plant are much more tender than the roots. So we typically don't wash those with a strong stream of water, like you know, under any pressure. Um, there are maybe some exceptions to this in terms of barks and that sort of thing. But with leaves, what you want to do is dunk them and, and sort of wash them gently in wash buckets that are full of potable water. And many times, depending on how much soil and sand and dirt has been splashed up on those leaves in the production of these plants, you may want to use several waters when you're washing them to make sure that they're really clean. Okay, the, um, as we mentioned a little earlier, um, this, is a, this is a picture of a washing station with a stainless steel grate with black co-wash on top. You can use this type of screen with both roots and herb, the upper aerial parts of the plant, and with barks. Basically, basically what you're trying to do is to uh, create an environment where you're able to uh, apply pressurized water to the surfaces to clean them, allow that dirty water to drain away so that it goes somewhere away from the roots that you're cleaning. Um, you also wanna make sure that whatever surface you use is safe for food contact and can be easily cleaned and sanitized. And in this case, we're using stainless steel, steel screen. I will say stainless steel is quite expensive. Uh, there could be some other food safe uh, plastic mesh materials that you may research, but stainless steel is always a good bet. All right, yeah, and so that last question was about um, harvesting and processing things that might have um, properties that can have an adverse impact on the skin, so thanks for catching that, Robin. Yeah, I wanted to address that at the time because that was, I felt, an important omission, something that um, ought to be addressed when we were showing that cleaning going on. Great. So yeah, I'll give another minute for any other questions that come up um, in terms of cleaning. So we'll just take a short momentary break if anyone has any questions. All right, if any come in, um, Robin, I will just let you know so that we can address it before it becomes too late. But otherwise, we're gonna move right along. That sounds great. Okay, so the next step in our post-harvest handling process is cutting and silence reduction. 
Now, what do we mean by that? Basically, we're talking about bringing down the size of roots primarily, um, it, you know, in terms of um, uh, making them easier to handle and also making them um, or, or getting them into a state where when we put them into the drying process, which we'll talk about in a little while, that they dry more evenly and more quickly. So in the case of something like black cohosh on your left, and we could apply this to things like um, bloodroot or blue cohosh, um, let's see, Solomon seal, those types of things that you know have, have some fleshy under, under soil uh, plant parts, uh, we will take and, and reduce the size of that to a manageable uh, level. When we're looking at green leafy material and herb and um, herb and stem bearing plant parts, uh, like we have on the right here, we handle those a little differently typically. Um, I think this next slide, we actually start with the, uh, the cutting of the woody biomass. So Sierra, let's bring that next slide up. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, most roots, uh, with, with one notable exception, American ginseng, you really don't want to do any cutting on that. Um, we could do a whole other presentation on preparation of American ginseng roots in terms of post-harvest handling. But we're going to speak mostly to plants like black cohosh, golden seal, Solomon seal, marshmallow, those types of things. Uh, typically, after we wash them, we cut them and bring the particle size down some. Like I say, this helps speed and facilitate even and more thorough drying once they go into um, your drying setup. Um, and this should be done with, with most roots of any size. When we're handling the top portion of plants like leaves and fresh herb, um, with few exceptions, we generally dry these whole. Um, what I have found, if we do much cutting on fresh herb before it's dried, we usually get a lot of oxidation and darkening around the edges where it's cut. It generally results in, a, in an inferior product at the end. I generally recommend drying herbs whole. Um, there may be some exceptions where the plant part is just too large to get into your, into your, drying, um, your drying area or your drying equipment, whatever you're going to be using. But for the most part, I recommend drying fresh herb whole and intact, and then particle reduction could be done afterwards. After the, after the herbs are dried, uh, what you see here is a screen, and, and there are a couple of ways we can do what's called garbling or sorting. Typically, what we're trying to do is to establish a uniform particle size or to get at any stems that are too large or any uh, plant parts that are not supposed to be in the final product. Um, there's a screen here that can be used to facilitate this process. It simply uh, serves as a mesh to provide you a uniform particle size. Over here to the right, we have various tubs that can be used in sorting and garbling. This is very species dependent and dependent also on your customer and the final state of the product and the plant material that you're offering to your customer. So make sure you check with them as to what exactly they're looking for and what they expect uh, when you're providing dried herb to your customer. One thing that we use at the Herb Hub and something that is certainly scale appropriate for use at home is a small shredder. This is an eco shredder, it's a little electric shredder that you can use to, I would say, primarily um, shred and chop dried herb. Um, if you were going to use a shredder to reduce particle size of roots, if you had a lot of roots that you were processing, you would probably use a gasoline or PTO tractor mounted shredder. Uh, they're a little more heavy duty. Something like this is not going not to cut wild yam roots, probably won't do too good of a job of black coash roots certainly won't cut stone root, but it does a good job for leaves. So this is something you can use to reduce particle size um, a little more quickly than you could accomplish by hand. So 
still haven't gotten any questions yet, um, but go ahead and keep them coming. I think we're just going to keep going through, and if any questions come up, I'll just ask you to pause, Robin, and we'll just address it there. So thanks, everybody. Okay. So the next stage in post-harvest handling is drying. Um, the reason we dry is for long-term shelf stability of plant products. Uh, how good of a job we do in drying will certainly determine how well our product will keep. Uh, if we don't dry thoroughly and dry well, uh, after things are put up, they tend to mold and deteriorate, oxidize. Uh, but if we do a good job of drying, this really goes a long way in making sure that we offer a quality product at the end of the process. Much like our selection of hand tools or harvest tools in general, um, you know, we have a wide range of options in terms of what we can use to dry plant material. The main things in terms of principle that we're looking for uh, we need an atmosphere that features low humidity and we need good air circulation. Uh, a lot of people think that we need to apply heat during this process. That's something you want to be careful with. You can certainly heat up material too much and cook it. That's why I typically, you know, don't recommend a lot of heat uh, for the most part. Sometimes heat is simply introduced into the equation to lower relative humidity. So if you've got an area that you're trying to dry in that is otherwise hard to control your humidity, you may want to put something like a little electric heater in there to lower your relative humidity. But what I found uh, in my production is I can generally get good drying with something as simple as a fan and a good dehumidifier that we show over here on your right. In terms of drying, you, you really don't have to have any elaborate setup. This is a uh, extremely simplistic setup that we have at the Herb Hub that's a makeshift dryer. And it simply is an enclosure with um, some construction film that's up on a wooden frame enclosing a fan and a dehumidifier with some shells in there. And so the purpose of the plastic is simply to uh, contain this low humidity atmosphere in this area without letting the you know ambient humidity from the rest of the facility come into this drying area and the fan is in there of course to provide good air circulation so this has been fairly successful but this is this is a um a makeshift dryer that we are um updating and replacing uh currently There are some other options depending on, um, you know, your space and your budget. Uh, over here at the left, we have a programmable electric dryer. Now this dryer does provide both heat and air circulation. It primarily provides heat to, as a means to lower the humidity within the chamber. It's a, that's the only dehumidification uh, mechanism that is used in this type of dryer. Uh, as I said before, you want to be careful with your application of heat when you're drying plant material. I can tell you from practical experience, uh, when I first started in the business, I was drying some butternut root bark. And I had a dryer much like the one on the left. And I put the fresh bark in there, set it at 125 degrees, came back a few hours later, and the air in the room, all the shells in the wall were bright yellow and I could barely breathe in there. So what had happened was, um, and I found out the hard way, there are some volatile compounds in butternut root bark that volatilize at around 125 degrees. So what I did, I backed the heat down to around 115 in the same dryer, never had a problem uh, since then. So, you know, that's not information that you're gonna find in a food processing book or herb processing book, that's practical experience. But generally, you know, if you, if you use heat, 100, 105, 110 degrees is generally uh, more than adequate uh, to dry herbs with. Uh, because when you get the heat up too high, you start to degrade the quality of the herb. You'll get compounds that volatilize 
and you may have other problems as well. Uh, over here on the right, we have a um, what typically is used as a bulk tobacco dryer. Uh, this is one that was donated to the Herb Hub by Gaia Herbs, I believe it was, and they did not use it to dry tobacco as far as I knew, they, or as far as I know, they used it to dry their herbs. But that's the, these types of dryers were originally designed as bulk tobacco dryers. Typically, they're fired by liquid propane gas or sometimes fuel, fuel oil. You may be able to find electric, ver electric versions, but typically something at this scale is something that only a larger herb business would need. Okay, Robin, so we did get a question and that's in home settings, can I use paper bags hung in a wide, uh, warm, dry space? Paper, paper bags would be fine after materials dry. During the drying, I wouldn't rec recommend enclosing the herb in anything that's going to uh, disrupt good air circulation. Um, you know, if you've got a high humidity situation, you'll have stuff mold in paper bags just like you would plastic bags, even if it's not sealed. So, um, you know, anything that's going to block good circulation, I would omit from the drying process. Uh, paper is certainly okay for short-term storage afterwards, but I would not necessarily use it in the drying process. I would, I would leave the material out in the open with a fan or something blowing on it, if at all possible. And out of the sun, that's right, right? They made it, and that's, that's an important point that um, I should have already made, so I appreciate you bringing it up, Sierra. I don't recommend drying anything in the sun. Um, I have never seen material dried in the sun uh, in terms of herbs that look very good to me. Uh, I've, you know, we have sun-dried tomatoes, uh, typically in other climates that's done, uh, but herbs typically, they discolor, they oxidize. I just, I don't like drying anything in the sun. Even with solar herb dryers, I've not seen one that does a really good job. Great, thanks Robin. Sure. Okay, so after our drying is complete, or we think it's complete, how do we know it's complete? There are basically two ways that I'm aware of. Um, and what we're trying, what we mean by dry is we're looking for a target moisture content of around or below 12%. Uh, and you can ascertain that in two different ways. On the left, we have a moisture analyzer. Uh, we have one of these at the Herb Hub. Uh, for the beginner or small scale producer, they're typically a little too expensive in terms of investment. Uh, they may be a little complex in terms of, of the way they're, um, you know, figuring out how to use one, uh, but they are probably the most accurate way. They're, the, they're the, really the only way to determine uh, percentage of moisture content, but there is another way to determine if your material is dry. And one way to determine if your material is as dry as it's gonna get is to weigh it uh, before you put it in your dryer, you know, write that weight down. And what I mean by weighing it, if you're weighing it in the tub, make sure that you zero out your scales, you know, with the tub on it. So, and, and keep track of, you know, whether you're just drying, whether you're just uh, weighing the material or the material in the container that it's in. So you can either zero your scales out with the container on it or, you know, weigh the herb in your container and just make sure that you always weigh it in the container so you get a consistent measurement. But after you begin the drying process, take your herb, put it on your scale in the same manner that you started with and every, every few days weigh it. And at the point where the weight um, becomes stable, you stop losing weight. That means you stop losing moisture. So that material is generally as dry as it's gonna get. There are some other characteristics that we'll talk about with dry material. <coughs> Excuse me. Just a second. And that's pretty obvious here with this um, nice lavender from the shell. This of course being the green lavender is quite quite pliable. You know obviously this is very green. You can tell by looking at it. Very fresh. Uh, this material here is dried, it becomes quite brittle. Now this is not enough in terms of testing whether something's dry, but when it snaps, you know you're almost there. Could be all the way there in case of this. Um, but those are some physical attributes that you may wanna look for in terms of 
whether my material is dry or not. But weight is a sure way to find out. Okay. We're going to go backwards. Yeah, okay. so if anyone has any questions, just go ahead and drop them in the Q&A, but otherwise we'll just keep moving right along. All right, thank you, Sierra. We have a nice picture of the desert over here on the left, and why in the world do we have that in there? Um, there are some parameters that we look to to determine uh, long-term storage of herbs. You know, after you've done a nice job of drying your herb and roots, uh, how do we keep them in, you know, tip-top shape until either we use them or, or move them to a final consumer? And the key with this in terms of storage is low humidity, low light, and relatively cool temperatures. And, you know, what I mean by cool temperatures, we don't need refrigeration. Uh, with fresh herbs, we do need refrigeration, but with dry herbs, we don't need refrigeration. What I'm talking about by cool temperatures or something that is within the human comfort zone of, you know, 60 to 75, maybe 80 degrees or less. Uh, if you start getting too high temperatures, even if you've got low humidity and, and, and no or low light present, you might start to get some oxidation or some long-term degradation going on in the containers. But basically, relatively cool temperatures, room temperature or less, low light, certainly no direct sunlight, if you can limit exposure to even artificial light, that's good too, better. Um, and low humidity. Once you get the once you get the humidity, the, the the moisture out of the plant material, you want to make sure that that material stays dry. And the only way to do that is to make sure that the ambient humidity is very low in those storage conditions. One way to accomplish this are sealed storage bags like the one shown on the left. Um, if the material is dry thoroughly and properly, it can be sealed up in a plastic bag like this one shown, and it typically will stay in a, in a um, state of stasis. It will not pick up any moisture. It won't lose any moisture uh, because it's completely sort of hermetically sealed from the ambient environment around it. Uh, one caveat, if the material is not completely dry and you put in a plastic bag, you're going to have a problem with spoilage. So this material needs to be completely dry, then you seal it up, and it should stay dry if it's sealed correctly. The one thing I'll also mention about these clear plastic bags is they don't protect from UV rays or any other types of light. So you want to make sure that the entire bag is stored away in a dark area. Uh, other types of storage bins are one like I used to use in my business. Um, these are food grade rubber storage tubs. Um, they are particularly useful if you're storing material that you need to have ready, ready access to. You know, the bag that we showed you in the last uh, slide is something you would have to cut open and reseal if you uh, ever wanted to get in there and use some herb and, and you know, but didn't need it all. These particular storage bins, uh, while they're not airtight, they typically are very useful um, for long-term storage in a climate-controlled area. In other words, if you're using a, a container like this that's not completely airtight, you want to make sure the, that the ambient environment in the storage area surrounding them is cool, low humidity. Um, light, these are protected from light. So, uh, this type of opaque plastic is excellent uh, in terms of shielding your stored material from light. Uh, I would say that, you know, sunlight is, you know, direct sunlight coming through a window, even with these, is, is not a great thing. There will be some light, you know, leaking through this, um, through these plastic walls. And, you know, light is also not good for plastic anyway. You may start to degrade the plastic in some instances. So direct sunlight is never a good thing. Even artificial light should be kept to minimum. These containers certainly do that. And they do a pretty good job of keeping the relative humidity within the containers uh, stable 
just make sure that you store these in an area where it's climate controlled. All right, Robin, any last things to add here? I think that's about it. Um, I mean, we could go on and on. There are lots of little intricacies about harvest and post-harvest handling, cleaning and drying that are very species specific. You know, um, I think the point that came up earlier about using protective equipment uh, or protective personal equipment is a good one. Um, keep in mind that when you're handling any types of herb, um, you know, some like this lavender are soon to be completely safe. I can generally handle this, but someone could have um, an allergic reaction to this lavender. And so you just want to make sure that, you know, you, you use all applicable caution when you're handling materials. Uh, also, uh, from a sanitation standpoint, you want to make sure, of course, that you're using good personal hygiene, um, maybe even using gloves with regards to that. So many of these, like I say, are very species specific and uh, we can maybe address another time with questions that folks can shoot to us at some point. Yeah, and I think that just goes back to um, what we stated at the beginning of the series or of this segment, which is just do your research um, on the, the herbs that you're gonna be har harvesting and processing. Exactly. Um, the, there's a question, are there any publications that address species-specific handling tips? I will say that we did add some resources at the bottom of your handout page, um, but Robin, can you speak on any other um, species-specific publications that you know of or where to find them? Um, you know, these are, these are minor crops, so it's not like you can generally go down to your extension office and find out, you know, uh, post-harvest handling practices for uh, black cohosh, most of these forest botanicals. But Sarah, we did bring up a book yesterday at a webinar that I think has um, a section on post-harvest handling. Janine Davis and Scott Person's book that you um, showed folks yesterday, I think it was, what was it growing? You happen to have it right there, except it's upside down. <laughs> you I can tell. It's okay. Growing marked in golden, ginseng, golden seal, and other woodland medicinals. It's a great text for the beginner. And I, I do think it has um, not only production guidelines, but also some uh, harvest and post-harvest handling protocols that are specific for woodland medicinals. Um, you know, there are other crops like lemon balm and um, various mints that, you know, you may find some university-based research on. Uh, Purdue University has a pretty good site. Um, I can't remember. Um, I can't remember the name of the website or the link to it right offhand. But Purdue is a land grant university. They do have an extension component, and probably if someone were to search, you know, Purdue post harvest handling, you know, uh, spearmint, you know, they probably will find something. Uh, some, you know, some states have uh, more cultivation of some of these field-grown herbs than others, but I do know most forest botanicals, there's not a whole lot written on post-harvest handling, cleaning, drying, that sort of thing. Okay, and some other questions we got are, do you record where the plants are harvested? Do you find that to be a relevant thing to record? What, what was that question again? Do I record, record where they're harvested from? Yes, where. Okay. Yeah, you know, if you're if you're involved in certified organic certification, you need to have uh, harvest maps and document those areas that you're harvesting from anyway. Um, for me, I'm typically harvesting in the same areas over and over and over on my farm, um, so it's not so much of an issue. Uh, but yeah, if you're harvesting from other areas off farm, or you have a large parcel of land. And, you know, you're incorporating that in your, um, your lot numbers or your traceability and your paper trail in terms of food safety requirements. Yeah, I'd say definitely record where those are harvested from. And another question we got, um, you can keep them coming now, but this is the last one we have so far. And then I'll go into wrapping up and then we'll take some more questions. Do you need to identify them as specific batches? And by them, I mean specific um, harvests and harvest date periods. 
yeah, you want to you want to record your harvest area, your harvest dates, and um, any relevant information. If if you're not a one man show like I was, or one person show like I was, um, you want to probably record uh, you know what employees responsible for processing them, um, the dates of processing, where they were harvested from, and if you have more than one processing facility or multiple types of processing equipment um, for your own benefit it'd certainly be good to record you know what type of equipment was used and that sort of thing for traceability great so y'all can um, ask any other questions but i will just say um in the meantime i'm going to leave this screen up until we have any other questions but thank you so much for joining us um, for the second second segment of the second session of Seed to Medicine Chess. Um, if you enjoyed the webinar today, please consider donating to Appalachian Harvest Herb Hub. Um, this is how we um, continue to fund and offer assistance to forest farmers, among other things. And so we appreciate any donations, but we mostly just appreciate you joining us here today. So we'll just hang out here for a sec in case you have any other questions. Um, but otherwise, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Sierra. I'll just stop sharing that screen then. <laughs> All right, well, it looks like we don't have any additional questions and we're coming in right at the end of our hour long session. So thank you again, everyone for coming. Uh, we appreciate your thanks as well. So we will catch you next time. The next webinar, if you have already registered, is August 1st. We are full, but we are also working on making these available to everyone on YouTube. Um, so follow Appalachian Sustainable Development on Facebook. You can just search our name. Um, we're also on Instagram, ASDevelop, um, well, at, at ASDevelop. And we'll be posting when we get these live. So um, hopefully we'll see you next time. But thanks for joining us today. Happy Saturday, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for your good questions and comments. <laughs>